mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. We apologize for starting a few moments late, but we have our technical glitch under control now. Uh, my name is Christine Dursey Davis. I'm the executive director of the Ohio chapter of APA and uh, vice chair of the New Urbanism Division. And I'll be the moderator for today's webcast. So today is Friday, March 27th, and we will hear the presentation Reshoring the Urgent Need to Bring Manufacturing Back to America. For technical help during today's webcast, type your questions in the chat box found in the webcast toolbar to the right of your screen or call the 1-800 number shown. For content questions related to the presentation, type those in the questions box also located in the webinar toolbar to the right of your screen. And we will answer those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. On your screen is a list of the sponsoring APA chapters and divisions. Thanks to all of the participating sponsors for making these webcasts free to members. Um, today's webcast is sponsored by the Economic Development Division. To learn more about APA chapters, visit planning.org slash chapters. And to learn about divisions such as today's sponsor, visit planning.org slash divisions. On your screen is a list of our upcoming webcasts. To register for these, please visit utah-apa.org slash webcasts. Are you interested in presenting a session? Contact your chapter or division, or feel free to email Ben Frost at bfrost at nhhfa.org. To log your CM credits for attending today's webcast, uh, go to your dashboard on APA's website and select Activities by Provider. Again, today's provider is the Economic Development Division, and then you can select today's webcast. This webcast is available for 1.5 CM credits for live viewing only. Some of our recorded webcasts are available for distance education CM credit. Uh, to see availability for distance education credits, check again our webcast webpage at utah-apa.org slash webcasts. If you haven't, like us on Facebook, Planning Webcast Series, to receive up-to-date information on our sessions. And we are recording today's webcast. It will be available on our YouTube channel. Just search Planning Webcast on YouTube, and a PDF of the PowerPoint will be available at ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. Okay, I'd now like to introduce today's speaker, Rosemary Coates. Rosemary is the Executive Director of the Reshoring Institute, a 501c3 nonprofit collaboration with the University of San Diego. She is also the president of Blue Silk Consulting, a global supply chain consultancy. She is an Amazon.com best-selling author with four books, 42 Rules for Sourcing and Manufacturing in China, 42 Rules for Superior Field Service, Negotiation Blueprinting for Buyers, and the Reshoring Guidebook. Rosemary earned an MBA from the University of San Diego and a Bachelor of Science in Business from Arizona State University. She has been a management consultant for 25 years, helping over 80 global supply chain clients. She serves on the board of directors of the University of San Diego Supply Chain Management Institute and teaches supply chain architectures and strategies at UC Berkeley. She is passionate about bringing manufacturing back to America. With that, I am going to turn it over to Rosemary. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, finally. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, 
Can you see my screen? Yes. All right. Very good. All right. Beautiful. Now, can you see the full screen? Oh, okay. We had a little technical difficulty this morning, but, uh, but I think we got it straight now. All right. Take it away. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much for that introduction, and I'm delighted to be here with all of you today to talk to you about my very favorite subject these days, which is uh, reshoring manufacturing to the U.S. Um, um, as mentioned, I've been in the uh, consulting world for about 25 years, and in the past 15 years, maybe 20 years, I've been helping a lot of companies uh, uh, offshore their production to China in particular, so doing a lot of expansion, um, uh, building new factories, expanding current factories, solving uh, sourcing issues and quality problems and so forth in China. Um, and then about two years ago, um, maybe a little bit longer now, uh, I, I started feeling a little uncomfortable about that because uh, the economic results were pretty devastating in the U.S. And then we had a family reunion, and I have five grandchildren. And I was looking at those grandkids thinking, you know, if we keep doing this, we keep offshoring all of our manufacturing, my grandkids aren't going to have a future. And that weighed heavily on me. And so as a result, we sort of shifted positions and, and started talking to our clients about, uh, about what they might be able to bring back, what they might be able to reshore in terms of manufacturing. Um, and I guess, you know, I think reshoring might be a little bit of a misnomer. Sometimes people call it onshoring and um, nearshoring, and there's all kinds of terms for it. Um, but really, I think these days it's global manufacturing strategy. So where in the world should you be manufacturing, and what products should be, you be manufacturing in each of those locations? And that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, so it's really a, 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 an evolution rather than just simply bringing manufacturing back. So here we go. Okay. Let's see. How oh, come I can't go to the next page? If you're We're if you're having technical yeah, technical just technical hit next. Today. Trying to. Hmm. Okay. There we go. Okay. Okay. So uh, this is me, um, and I know you know I was. This was mentioned kind of in the introduction, but um, here are my books. I'm proud of those. This one happens to be a bestseller and has been on Amazon for about five years. Um, and I think people are still very interested in sourcing in China. So, um, so that's there. And then the reshoring guidebook we introduced this year, um, and uh, um, are selling it on Amazon as well as the website. Okay, so um, I am the president of Lucil Consulting, which is my own consulting firm, and that's where I've been talking to the clients about reshoring. And then in October, we established the Reshoring Institute uh, with the University of San Diego. And there we are, let's see if we can, oh, there we go. And at the University of San Diego, we are helping companies identify what they could reshore. We're doing research projects, and we have student interns. So today we have three paid student interns that are doing research based on the things that we think uh, need to come to the surface regarding reshoring, as well as uh, we take on uh, paid research for our clients. Um, we're a nonprofit, so our, the, the cost to do that is really inexpensive. All right. So what exactly is reshoring? Um, obviously, it's the process of bringing manufacturing and other jobs that were previously offshored back to America and to Europe. And it's Im important to recognize that they're also coming back to Europe. Um, just as in the U.S., the European manufacturing base was um, sort of gutted over the last 20 years or so. And many European countries, uh, England in particular, is working hard to, to effect reshoring for their own countries. 
So we used to think that manufacturing would never come back to the U.S. In fact, I can remember having a conversation over dinner with somebody about five years ago saying, there's no way manufacturing is never coming back here. It's too expensive in the U.S. and this is going to happen and we should look at global, uh, global resources and global sourcing. Um, but then everything changed. During 2012, the presidential elections, both Barack Obama and Mitt Romney blamed China for America's decline. And you can probably remember um, the debates on TV. And over and over again, they were saying, you know, China is the problem. All, China stole all of our jobs. You know, everything uh, that we're getting is cheap goods made from China. You know, China is the problem, and so forth. And you know, China isn't really the problem. Uh, it is our business quest to always look for the least cost point or the least cost manufacturing. Um, and so in doing, in determining reshoring, there's more to it than simply blaming one country or another for their policies. Once Obama was elected, he challenged uh, U.S. manufacturers to bring manufacturing back. In fact, in the 2013, 2014, and this year's State of the Union address, Obama talked about reshoring, albeit he calls it onshoring, onshoring um, but he is talking about uh, bringing manufacturing back. In 2014, the camera panned to Tim Cook, who's the CEO of Apple, of course, and Tim had agreed to work on a project to bring some of the manufacturing from Apple back to the U.S. And as you probably know, Apple doesn't manufacture any of their own equipment. They have uh, it all outsourced to contract manufacturers, mostly Foxconn, uh, the famous contract manufacturer in China. Well, over the next year, they actually brought back two production lines one in uh, Silicon Valley area and one in Texas, and they're producing Apple products here in the U.S., also still using Foxconn as a contract manufacturer, but still they are manufacturing in the U.S., so pretty cool. So why are companies considering reshoring now? Well, the mood of America has certainly changed. Um, it used to be, and there were lots of famous studies where Americans would always buy the cheapest goods. So there was a famous sock study that was done at Walmart, for example, um, where Walmart put out two bins of socks. Um, one were manufactured in, in Asia, I think in China, uh, and another bin were, were made in the USA and were labeled made in the USA. And they were more expensive. And in almost all, every case, people chose the least expensive product. So they looked exactly the same. Uh, there was no discernible quality difference. Um, it was just that the Asian manufactured goods were cheaper. But the mood of America changed after the election. And now people are interested in buying goods that are made in America. So the new studies and the new comparisons show that if we can get products that were within 10 to 15 percent of the same price, that people will, in general, choose the made in, the manufacture, made in America manufactured goods. So that's one of the reasons why companies are now reshoring. Um, there's certainly a maturing of supply chain management strategies. Uh, in the old days, back when I first started in business, um, there was no global email. There was no way to communicate anything uh, except by telephone. So you had to actually pick up the phone and try to try to you know move a container load or move a few pallets of air freight from Singapore to the U.S. and you had to beg on the phone to do that. Today's uh, manufacturing and, and supply chain strategies are enhanced through global communications as well as there are patterns and ability to control what's happening around the world um, in your own supply chain. And that gives you options. When you can see the alternatives, then you can make different choices. So that's an important component. The introdu introduction of new technologies such as robotics, 3D printing, and 5-axis milling, those are big leaps and bounds that allow for um, a certain amount of automation to take place in manufacturing plants that reduces the cost and improves efficiency across the board. And that makes a big difference in the equation as, as to whether something is cost effective or not. 
There are also many, many incentives offered by governments, and I know a lot of you on the phone today represent local and state and local governments, and um, you're probably offering incentives to uh, various businesses to come and locate in your area, and that's another development that we've seen get a lot of action and a lot of interest and a lot of movement in the last couple of years. And then there's this thing called corporate economic patriotism. So just like me, when I turn the corner looking at my grandchildren, um, I think uh, corporations in America are starting to do that same kind of examination and trying to determine whether or not they can bring manufacturing back and support the U.S. economy. So why are companies reshoring now is going on with that argument. There's certainly also some other economics uh, on the other side, on the foreign side of uh, global manufacturing. There's a rise in Chinese wages of about 15 to 18 percent per year for the last 14 years, an annual energy cost increase of 5 to 10 percent. Now, those are the statistics that you hear in the Western press over and over and over again. People will say, oh, it's gotten too expensive to manufacture in China, or energy costs have go, are going up and so forth. And I'm going to show you in a minute that that isn't going to make a hill of beans a difference. Um, even though the wages have gone up significantly, they're still so low by comparison to other places in the world that it isn't going to make much difference in your, in your equation unless you have uh, a super high proportion of, of labor in your manufacturing processes. And energy costs, um, while they're kept low, uh, represent only uh, less than 5% usually of the cost to manufacture. So an increase in energy costs doesn't make much difference in the overall equation. However, fluctuating oil prices uh, have made a pretty big difference in international freight costs. So for example, a container from uh, Shanghai to Los Angeles used to cost them well, it depends on what commodity is inside, but it used to cost around $1,000. These days, those same containers can cost as much as $2,000 each to move. So, you know, there's a big significance in, in the uh, labor, or in the freight costs. Certainly, we've all heard difficulty in dealing with quality issues in China and intellectual property issues. Those are commonly reported and are true in most cases. Um, so, you know, that puts more difficulty in your global supply chain equation. And then lower natural gas prices in the U.S. have really contributed to lower chemical costs because, of course, um, the oil industry is also related to the chemical industry and lower energy costs. So these are some of the reasons why all of a sudden companies are waking up and trying to determine whether or not they could, in fact, reshore. But the U.S., and I would caution you here because um, to think that it's simply a matter of bringing manufacturing back is not the complete story. The U.S. is not going back to 1960s manufacturing. So this is, this is not your grandfather's um, 1950s or 60s factory that was dirty and dark and smelly and dangerous. That's not what we're looking at anymore. Today's factory is much more likely to be full of robots. It's clean it's efficient, and it's fully automated. Uh, in the picture there, you see the little robot called Baxter, which has made some huge breakthroughs. This is the company that developed Baxter um, has reduced the cost of those, uh, those machines way, way, way down, so they're quite affordable. I think they're in the neighborhood of $20,000, $25,000 to buy one now. And you see it's got a little face on it, so they're, they're making robots friendly. They're also capable of working side by side with human beings. So in the old days, even though we've had robots for a long time in manufacturing, they were big, huge machines that were sort of dangerous to be around and so forth. Today's robots are small, they're inexpensive, and they can work side by side with humans. I've actually seen this robot um, in action. And the interesting part is it doesn't require any special programming or you know, uh, an engineer, a software engineer to come out and fix it or anything like that. You program Baxter by taking his arm and showing it what to do. So you pick up a piece from the assembly line and you put it somewhere else. And you do that two or three times and then Baxter knows what to do. 
pretty cool. 3D printing we talked about, um, as you know, that's also called additive manufacturing, and layer by layer it builds, builds up products. Um, so this is an interesting uh, development because it allows for um, mass customizations and um, prototype parts and specialty things. So, for example, um, a set of dentures for your mouth, which is unique to you, has unique size. Um, a hip joint replacement, unique to you and a unique size. These are the sort of things that can be uh, 3D printed very efficiently. So it's really opened up a whole new industry and approach for how you can customize uh, uh, products and really make them more efficient. And then fully automated production lines, as I mentioned, five access milling is a, another breakthrough technology that allows not only XYZ access, but two additional accesses so that you can tilt a, a machined part uh, and it becomes much more accurate and more efficient. Okay, so Walmart, all things, is leading the charge. So I, I was surprised by this. This photograph actually is the U.S. Manufacturing Summit that Walmart put on in Denver last year, and we attended. So we had a booth there and also attended the, the big opening ceremony that they had. And I got to tell you, it was quite impressive. Um, Walmart has made a determination that they want to help companies find products and sell products in their stores that are manufactured in the U.S. And as a result of that, um, they have started a huge U.S. manufacturing initiative. Uh, they have a whole team working on this. They have uh, done all kinds of things to help suppliers, like having open source days where you could come and pitch new products to Walmart, and they're helping suppliers and so forth. Um, but they, the biggest thing is they really put their money where their mouth is. You can see at the top, they have announced $250 billion dollars in investment to buy U.S. made goods over the next 10 years that will then be resold in Walmart stores. And because Walmart is such an enormous uh, retailer, the largest in the world, when they set a trend or they start moving in one direction, other retailers are going to follow. So I think we're going to see the floodgates sort of open here and a lot of products being brought back to the U.S. Okay, um, but all of that is on the outward side. What's also important um, is that governments back us and put um, context around what we're doing in reshoring. And um, so we have federal, state, and local governments that supply all kinds of incentives and so forth for us to move forward. The backbone of that is the Revitalized American Manufacturing Act of 2014, and it creates a network for manufacturing innovation, um, including up to 45 institutes that are going to be developed to work on specific areas of technology over the next couple years. So <clears throat> these institutes bring together companies and universities and other technical uh, professionals. Um, they're supported by federal agencies, there's co-investment going on, but all of that creates a kind of a background for, uh, for allowing companies to spring forward and invent new products and to determine how we might be able to uh, uh, identify new manufacturing technologies, how we get better at it, how we uh, market the right products to the world, how we determine what can be sold here. So that backbone, that backbone is very important. That context in which we're reshoring is very important. In President Obama's State of the Union, just two months ago, January 20th, 2015, he emphasized, again, sustaining growth in the U.S. manufacturing sector. Um, and that includes new lower tax rates for manufacturers, which, you know, is, if you're a manufacturer, you know we've been complaining about this for a long time. And we know that business has to be competitive on the world stage in order to have competitive pricing. Fair and transparent regulations, energy policy that favors manufacturing, and that includes all of the OSHA requirements and so forth. So there's an attempt being made to make it a better environment in which manufacturers can operate. 
We're certainly encouraging uh, innovation through the innovation hubs. U.S. patent reform, which is a huge deal in Silicon Valley. I know that I live in Silicon Valley. Um, and U.S. patent reform is a very, very important issue for companies that are driving new technologies here. Improvement of the U.S. infrastructure, of course, that means roads and bridges and ports, which, you know, when you look at other countries in the world, and we are so far behind. Um, I go to China a lot for my clients, and, you know, it's phenomenal. The bridges, the roads, the ports, the, the train stations, the things that they've built in the last 25 years are absolutely amazing. And then, you know, I come home and I'm driving down 101 from the San Francisco airport and it's bumpy and there's potholes and, boy, you know, I'm thinking it's just, there's no comparison. And so we really need to focus on improving our infrastructure. Uh, if we want to be a manufacturing powerhouse again in the future, that is essential. Energy independence is really important for us, too, and I think we're, we're moving in that direction. Um, through all kinds of new techniques, certainly the shale oil production and other things are allowing for reduction in price of energy. And then education and training. So this is a key issue. And you'll see I have some other slides about this in a little bit, but one of the key issues in, um, in manufacturing are the ability to have trained workers, skillful workers. And the difference is um, these days, manufacturing jobs, many of them I think are sort of a crossover between skilled workers and engineering. So the workers also need to be able to do things like uh, program a simple robot or change NC machine setup or uh, uh, re-engineer the processes uh, through a lean manufacturing approach, those kind of things. So the, the, the worker skill has increased. And where those skills are being taught today are mostly in the community colleges and trade schools. Which there's fewer trade schools these days, but mostly in the community colleges. So what Obama did was propose free education for the community colleges around the country, which will definitely help, will definitely help to train those workers in the skills that we need. Okay, so with all that being said, should manufacturers completely leave China? Um, and as I mentioned before, I think this reshoring is kind of a misnomer. Instead of saying we should just bring everything back, I think we need to be smart about it and determine what we manufacture and which market. You can see China, about 35 to 40 percent of the world's manufactured goods come from China, um, which it should be surprising to everyone. I mean, that is just an amazing percentage. So, you know, a third to a half of the world's production is in China. Our supply base is there, so not only has manufacturing moved there, but all the suppliers that support it are there as well. The skills, um, so once again, it comes up, we offshored all of our production, but we also sent away all those skills. So for 10 or 15 years, uh, tool and die makers, machine shop operators, uh, skilled laborers in a manufacturing environment, all those jobs have gone away. And guess what? They're all in China. So we need to focus on redeveloping that. Um, by Chinese law, so, you know, as you probably know, in America we have uh, laws that say you have to, um, if you're selling to the government, you have to uh, produce your products in the U.S. Um, it, there are some exceptions to that, but by and large, the U.S. government has to, and most governments, have to look at products manufactured at home before they're allowed to buy foreign products. Well, the Chinese have the same law. They have a buy Chinese law. And because there's a, a, a huge, huge market there for the Chinese government, if you're not producing in China, you can't sell to that market. So it's a consideration. Do you bring your manufacturing back here or do you keep some there? Uh, China is also the largest economy in the world and growing at 8% annually, but most importantly, China's middle class is expected to include 630 million people by 2022. So the whole entire population of the United States is only about 350 million people. In China today, the middle class alone is 350 million people. So just the middle class, then you've got the upper class and the lower class. Um, but that middle class is going to double 
in the next five or seven years. So really amazing. And as you know, when people are um, bootstrapped up into the middle class, they make more money, they buy houses, they buy cars, they buy big screen TVs, all, they remodel their kitchens, all the things that we do as middle class people. So if you're building, if you're making products, you have to look at that target market as being a growth place for you. So um, the Asian middle, middle class by two, 2030 will be 66% of the global share. So the middle class for the whole world is going to be in Asia primarily in the next 15 years or so. So it's likely to be the lar largest target market in the world for you. So should you leave China and or Asia? And my, my recommendation usually to my clients is probably not. But what you need to do is peel off a good percentage, probably 15 or 20 percent of your manufacturing and reestablish it here in the U.S. And when I'm talking about reestablishing that manufacturing in general, it's higher end, more sophisticated manufacturing. What we probably don't want back are t-shirt production, for example, where um, that can be done in Bangladesh or Indonesia or Myanmar or Vietnam for 50 cents an hour. 23 cents an hour in some places. That's not the kind of manufacturing we want back here because it's not going to create middle class jobs. Okay. So reshoring has begun in America. Uh, about 54% of U.S. manufacturers with annual sales greater than $1 billion say that they are either reshoring now or considering reshoring. 54%. When I saw that, I was really amazed. I mean, that's more than half of the manufacturers in the U.S. who say they're going to bring manufacturing back, at least those over a billion dollars. Since 2003, new offshoring is down by 70 to 80 percent, and new reshoring is up by 1,500 percent. And 50,000 jobs have been reshored to the U.S. since 2011. Now, one word of caution. Uh, you know, there's a, I saw somebody wrote this a, a while back in an article. The manufacturing went out like a tsunami. It went away like a tsunami. And it's coming back in raindrops. <laughs> so we're not going to reshore all of the jobs that were shipped overseas. But what we are bringing back are quality jobs that are directly aimed at the middle class. Uh, manufacturing jobs generally pay, uh, the statistics say they pay between sixty-five and $85,000 a year for a skilled manufacturing job. And that is right squarely in the middle class. So as we rebuild that middle class, people uh, in, in, that are making that kind of salary um, have certain patterns of behavior. They buy a house. They buy a car. They shop at Walmart. Um, and so there's a, a geometric effect, a magnifier effect, if you will, on what happens in the economy when we rebuild those good, skillful kind of manufacturing jobs. So what we want to reshore, reshore are those higher paying, more skillful jobs. So how will reshoring affect local location and development in America? Well, as I mentioned before, manufacturing looks different. It's not your grandfather's 1960s manufacturing. We're not opening big, ugly factories that pollute and smell and are dirty and dangerous. We're not doing that. We're reopening factories that are automated, that require skillful workers, and that are going to make a difference to the middle class. Uh, fully automated production lines like that. When, so when you open a factory like that, it requires different skills and different kinds of buildings. So the factory buildings are going to look different and you have to pay attention to what that means. Training and the quality of life are important factors in employee attraction and retention. So where are you going to attract new workers? Um, are workers going to want to live in your, in your vicinity, in your city, in your state? Um, what's the quality of life there? Uh, so if you're trying to determine whether to build a factory in the West, for example, versus maybe Boston, and I, I'm, I don't mean to beat on Boston, but you did have a pretty bad winter. So if a worker is trying to decide where they would prefer to work in Phoenix or in Boston, you know, that may make a difference in where you decide to locate your factory. 
uh, government incentives can be a deciding factor. So sometimes governments will offer all kinds of things. In Silicon Valley here, for example, um, the city of Santa Clara uh, has their own power plant. And so power rates are very cheap in that particular city. And as a result, that's the kind of incentive that companies will look at when they're making a, a decision as to where to locate. Uh, access to markets and proximity to suppliers and customers must be considered. So, uh, you know, it's nice to locate a plant wherever you want, but is that close to your suppliers? Or are you now going to have to consider long distance logistics costs to bring raw materials in and to ship products out? So when we approach um, a reshoring project, here are the moving parts that we look at. Um, we organize the prod project, we do cost evaluations, we have a lot of tools and things that we use for cost evaluation. We look at innovation of a product, how you automate the, the production line, do you localize the product, I'm going to talk about that in a minute. What skills and education are required and are they available in the local community? What taxes and other incentives are being offered by the government areas in, the, in those particular areas? Uh, can we work with the government? So here's an interesting one for those of you who work in government. We always try to reach out to our government officials and, and make those appointments and go and see them. I'll tell you, when I'm working with clients, in some cases it's a beautiful thing. Um, you know, the governments are willing to help and reach out and they offer services and so forth. In other cases, they're just not interested. And so we're not interested. <laughs> Um, you know, I've, I've met with the city manager of a fairly good-sized city, and he was like almost too busy to be in the meeting, said, yeah, yeah, you know, nice to meet you, but I really have something more important to do. And so we walked out of there and said, cross them off the list. So pay attention to that and be welcoming and help business. Um, your supply base considerations, as I mentioned before, you have to pay attention to where they are and how they fit. Marketing and PR is a big issue. Um, we put together a roadmap for reshoring and we help you build a business case. Okay, some success stories. Uh, you may have heard of GE Geospring water heater before. So most of us have big water heaters, white tanks that heat water all day long, whether we're home or not. Um, but GE has innovated a, a tankless water heater uh, and they, instead of producing that in China where most of their other white uh, water heaters are produced. They reopened a manufacturing plant in Kentucky to make the Geospring water heaters. They've been very, very successful. Now the thing is, a regular white water heater costs about $1,000 and a Geospring water heater costs about $3,500. So the market for the Geospring water heaters is in the U.S. This is a perfect match. They have developed a production line for goods that are going to be sold in the U.S. because this is where their market is. Um, so they've reorganized it, they've innovated the product, they have automated that line, and now are effectively producing the product in Kentucky. 1888 Towels is another um, example we always bring up. Uh, they worked with Walmart and uh, produced or uh, reopened a factory in Georgia and are producing sort of high-end luxury towels that are sold in Walmart now. Um, and they're more expensive than other brands Walmart sells there, but they have a big tag on it that says made in the USA. And as a result, they're selling quite well. Apple Computer, I mentioned before, um, Foxconn makes most of their products in China, in Shenzhen, and in uh, Chengdu, China. Those are the two big factories. Uh, and they have brought back manufacturing, contract manufacturing in California and Texas, and that means that they put Americans back to work. Starbucks, really important example, they reopened a plant in Ohio uh, and only put a handful of people back to work. It was a ceramics plant in Ohio. Those cups are the ones that you see in Starbucks all the time that say Manhattan or they say Chicago or they say Silicon Valley on them. Those are being produced now in the U.S. and are made in the U.S.A. goods. The thing about this was, um, when they did this back in, I think, 2013, they got so much publicity and goodwill. Um, they had article after article after article written about Starbucks and how they were bringing manufacturing back. And I've got to tell you, that publicity and great PR is 
very valuable to a company, very, very valuable. So you're looking at the economics profile of it, but you're also looking at uh, the marketing and PR part. Okay, so rebuilding the middle class in America. Uh, manufacturing is certainly key, as I mentioned, to middle class growth, and that's because of the magnifier effect that it has on, on the economy when we put middle class people to work. Immediately after World War II, manufacturing workers in America were at 30% of the total workforce, and today about 18%. And honestly, I don't see that going much higher. What we see coming back uh, is the kind of manufacturing that's more advanced and is going to require less workers. But we've stopped the bleeding. <laughs> so we're not just shipping everything to China automatically anymore. We're really looking at this in an analytical way and trying to determine what can either be brought back or kept here. Um, factory jobs are certainly key to economic growth and health in, in towns and communities across America, and I'm sure a lot of you know that you've experienced the pain of outsourcing, and hopefully we'll consider the joys or experience the joys of reshoring. There are different opinions about America's cost competitiveness. So the Chinese manufacturing laborer, on average, earns just 12% of the U.S. wages. Um, you will see all kinds of statistics also that are reported, and I would really encourage you to dig deeper and analyze what you see in terms of those statistics because they're used in uh, all sorts of press and articles and so forth, and they may not always be the correct reflection. But in general, the manufacturing laborers in China earn far less than the U.S. Chinese productivity is growing significantly faster than U.S. productivity. So all those workers and laborers in China are now being replaced by their own automation. So their focus on automation and, and advanced manufacturing is really amazing with how much speed they're doing it. So they're also um, modernizing and automating and will be competing on a higher and higher and higher level as time goes on. Lower energy costs from the U.S. from shale gas helps, but here's that statistic, less than 5% of the total costs in 90% of U.S. manufacturing industries are related to energy costs. Okay? So before, and you'll see this in the press all the time, that oh, lower energy costs so important, but it represents less than 5% of the total costs in 90% of U.S. manufacturing industries. So that's another one of those statistics you have to take with a grain of salt. Okay, let's look at the average manufacturing labor cost per hour in China versus the U.S. This is the other statistic you see over and over again. Oh, Chinese wages are going up and they're doubling and, you know, wow, it's a big deal. But look at reality. In the U.S. in, 2005, in 2015, 2015, in the U.S., the average cost per hour for a laborer is twenty-six dollars and ten cents, twenty-six and change. In China, two thousand fifteen, and this is an average. I, you know, and there are plenty of places in China where the wages are still under two dollars, but it's four fifty an hour. So even if, even if, the Chinese labor rate quadruples this year, which it won't, but even if it were to quadruple this year it still would be way less than the U.S. manufacturing costs. So you can't really make the argument that rising costs in China um, are what is the decision factor. It's certainly a contributing factor, certainly something that you consider, but it's not going to tip the balance. If you only consider labor costs, it's impossible for America to compete. So have a look at these costs. United States, this is from 2012, um, reported in 2013. So in the United States, um, cost per hour, $22.50, all the way down to Romania, $1.63, China, $2. There's just no comparison. Labor is going to be cheaper in these locations. That's why I said before that keeping t-shirt production, for example, um, in another low-cost nation is the right thing to do. But the highly skilled manufacturing, the clean manufacturing, the innovation, the automation, all of that should be considered for reshoring. The Chinese are also buying businesses in the U.S. So it's also not just about American businesses reshoring to the U.S. 
but attracting global businesses to come and produce here. Now, that, that may seem like an odd statement, but when Toyota or uh, Nissan or BMW or these Chinese manufacturers open up manufacturing plants in the U.S., guess what happens? They put Americans to work. And so generally, it's a good thing. It doesn't really matter who owns the business, per se. If the plant is being established in the U.S. and it's putting Americans to work, it's probably a good economic decision. Chinese firms now have more than 80,000 Americans on their payroll. A sharp, sharp, sharp increase from 2000. You can see that. So there was hardly any in 2000. In 2013, there's more than 80,000. STEM skills have been offshored, as you know, I mentioned this before, that it's not only the jobs that went overseas, but all the skills, the tool and die makers, the uh, machinists, the really skillful uh, manufacturing people have been laid off and put out of a job, and there's nobody backfilling. There's nobody climbing the ladder behind them. So the, I just want to, this is a bunch of statistics about uh, what manufacturers are saying, but the very top bullet point Nine out of ten manufacturers are having difficulty finding skilled workers, and they say this is directly hurting the bottom line. So to remedy this, and this comes up over and over again, to remedy this, we really need to focus on building skill sets at the community college level, because that's exactly what's been gutted in the last 15 years, and it's where we need to rebuild the skills. Skills requirements and the skills ladder by location, I always I lecture a lot at universities and I always tell the university students, when you're climbing up the ladder of success, look back and give a hand to the people who are behind you. So you need to determine a pathway up, but also help those who are behind you. Um, as we know, not all skills are available in every location, so when you're selecting a location, you need to pay attention to that. Um, you need to determine what skills are needed for manufacturing. Uh, are they available in the market? And if not, you may, and you decide to locate there, you may have to delay the opening until you get skilled workers through a training program or are able to find them across the country. Um, <clears throat> once again, the quality of life in the target area is really important. You know, what is the cost situation? You, if you're trying to get skilled workers to come to Silicon Valley, think again, <laughs> because the property costs are way too expensive and most people just can't afford to live here uh, at, at uh, 65 to $85,000 a year. So you may want to look for a different kind of environment where it's affordable and where people in the middle class are going to have a good life. Okay. So let's do a failure alert here. Um, probably everyone's heard of Otis Elevator. Uh, so about a year ago, they had a big splash in the Wall Street Journal because in 2013, Otis Elevator opened a new U.S. manufacturing plant in Florence, South Carolina, which was a great place, good quality of living, uh, nice people, affordable um, tax incentives, all kinds of good reasons, and they were bringing a production line back from China. But the project failed, and it cost the company $60 million in lost business. Because, because the primary reason was they didn't have the skilled manufacturing labor in the Florence area. So they, had, uh, they couldn't produce products fast enough. They didn't have enough workers. They couldn't get the skills they needed. Um, they failed to plan for the skilled labor developments. So they didn't work with the community colleges, and they should have done all of that in advance. Um, and they also had a concurrent SAP implementation, which if you've ever been through an SAP implementation, and I worked there, I worked at SAP for five years, so I know, um, it's a huge effort and really should be done alone and not concurrently with any other major development. So they were, it took them about a year or 18 months to recover from this, uh, but it could have really been avoided if they had done some planning for the skills in advance. Supply-based considerations, I mentioned this before too, so it's not only manufacturing your plant, but where's your supply base? So electronics are a very good example. Um, so finished products, laptops, iPods, smartphones, other devices have all been offshored uh, to contract manufacturers like Foxconn and Jabil and Luxtronics, but the semiconductors and all the components that go into the products have also been offshored. So remember, when you're 
relocating a plant, you also have to work with your suppliers to get them to relocate their supplies. And this is not a trivial task. We usually advise clients it will take you at least a year to get this done. So if you're planning on opening a plant, you need to know that you're not going to get those suppliers to relocate around you or to be able to supply to you very quickly. You need to plan for that. Shortening the supply chain through manufacturing near your customers is really important. Um, so reducing, it reduces risk. So bringing your suppliers close to you um, or being here in America with you uh, reduces risk. It, redu it reduces the need for working capital. You have shorter lead times. Increases your flexibility. There are all kinds of reasons why you would want to shorten the supply chain. So it's not just looking at one location, one manufacturing location. You, think, you need to think about the whole world. Where are your suppliers? How are you going to deal with that? What does the infrastructure look like? Where are your customers? How fast can you do turnaround time? The attractive locations in the U.S., so we always help clients work through what are the favorable business locations. Um, first of all, a favorable business environment, and I, I have to tell you, the southern states, um, so Texas, Mississippi, Alabama, the Carolinas, Louisiana, Tennessee, um, these are the states that are working very hard, Georgia is another one, working very, very hard um, to create a business environment that's welcoming and attractive for businesses to go there. The other states are also working on it, but aren't, as, uh, aren't moving as fast, I guess, and don't have as many things to offer as some of these states do. So they're playing catch up, um, including California, which is um, trying to attract new businesses, but has um, some catching up to do. Um, where are there supportive governments and incentives? How close are you to your customer base? So. If you're locating a business in the south, but your customers are all in Seattle, it's probably not a good match. So you need to think about that, too. Where's the skilled workforce as we've been talking about? What kind of labor rates are there? Um, how close are you to colleges and universities that can help provide skilled workers and engineers and other STEM-related uh, uh, professions that you'll need for your manufacturing site? And of course, accessibility to airports, highways, and rails, and your supply base. There's also the single sales fa factor that some of you know. This is where large corporations do business in more than one state and are subject to corporate income tax in multiple states. So a lot of municipalities have uh, looked at single sales factor as an attractive way of, um, of attracting new business by eliminating the multiple uh, tax rates that go on. There are also states with no sales tax, such as Alaska, Delaware, Montana, New Hampshire, and Oregon. And that can certainly represent a big savings if you're selling a lot in the local economy. No property taxes. So we see a lot of this in incentives with governments. Um, and, in, and employment tax credits for training and, and so forth. Other cost reductions, the fracking boom, we've talked about that. Um, that revolutionized U.S. oil and gas production, and now there's a, an abundance of inexpensive energy. Um, that's one thing where China is never going to be able to compete, because they do not have oil reserves, um, or at least very limited oil reserves in China. So while they're doing some offshore mining and drilling, um, they don't have the kind of oil reserves that we have here in the U.S. Um, so it makes it an attractive location for manufacturers that are energy intensive. And um, uh, chemicals and petrochemicals, of course, get the spin-off from that. Uh, strengthening of China's currency will erode the cost advantages that they have. And the WTO is trying hard to make that happen as well as we are with our trade policies. So China needs to float their currency upward, but very gently. They do it too quickly, it will devastate world manufacturing. Because you know we buy cheap Chinese goods to support our economy, uh, support our wants and needs, um, which drives their economy, which drives their manufacturing, which drives our ability to buy cheap goods. So to make big changes in currency adjustments right away affects that whole global system. So it needs to happen gently and consistently. Um, U.S. manufacturers have certainly enhanced their productivity and automation, 
Um, and you know, we're focused on lean and all kinds of ways that we can improve and survive. Okay, so there's more to consider beyond labor costs than what we've been talking about. Innovation, making new products like the GeoSpring automation, the five access milling, robotics, 3D printing, localization of your product for the local market like the GeoSpring, for example, partnering with educational organizations for improvement in skills and education, providing tax and incentives, providing a good connection with government, um, your supply base, paying attention to that, and certainly marketing and PR, telling everybody in the world that you are referring. The benefits of manufacturing in the U.S., certainly the creation of jobs, um, tax revenue increases when you're manufacturing here, you're, local to, you're closer to the U.S. consumer market if that's where you're selling products primarily, you have shorter supply chains, which reduces your risk. Um, you have access to new technologies with our new innovation hubs that are going up across America, supported by the federal government, local, state, and federal incentives. Okay, so this is the last slide. Um, what can you do personally to support reshoring? So it's not just about your company um, or your government or whoever you work for supporting reshoring. That's a huge component, of course. But you personally can do some things as well. You can buy Made in the USA products, so look for labels and products that say Made in the USA and buy those. Ask your retailers to stock American Made products. So don't sit back and just buy whatever they have to offer. If you see the store manager or stop at the customer service desk and, and register your vote, say, we, we want to see more products that are made in America. Support STEM skills and programs in elementary schools, high schools, colleges, and universities. I, I can say personally, I've been doing this with my grandkids. I've been, to, to the older ones, I've been saying, you know, you really ought to think about manufacturing engineering. What a great job that is. So encouraging them to do well in school and consider the possibilities of manufacturing engineering. You want to change the way you talk about manufacturing. So, you know, it's been kind of a, a dirty word around America for 25 years, and we now need to think about it because it is different in a new light. Today, manufacturing jobs are well-paid, professioned, in clean, high-tech environments and are exciting career paths. And we need to talk about it that way and start thinking about it that way. If you own stock in companies, tell the board and executives you want them to reshore. So send in your vote card and, and write across it, let's try to reshore manufacturing to the U.S. Or go to a, a meeting, tell the executives, write to them, stay online, let's bring back some of your manufacturing. And then vote for politicians who are working to bring manufacturing back, not those who give tax breaks to break up companies and ship them overseas. We want politicians, we want people in our government that are going to focus on the manufacturing environment because it's the right thing to do for the survival of America. And with that, this is my contact information. I'm going to turn it back over to our host, and uh, I think we take questions from here. Great, thank you. And we do have questions coming in, so we'll get started. Okay, um, there, there are several questions around the topic of um, robots like Baxter, for example. Um, we hear a lot already about U.S. jobs and the fact that machines are taking over people's jobs. So one machine can now take the place of what used to be 50 or 100 workers on the floor. So when we're, when we're talking about robots like Baxter and all these automations and things like that, um, are, are there still human components to this that it's worthwhile to bring these, these certain types of jobs back? Not like the t-shirt jobs that you mentioned before, but things that really require more technology now that might not necessarily need as many bodies on the floor. Um, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, so that's exactly what's happening. Yeah, it's, you know, as I mentioned, manufacturing jobs have gone out like a tsunami. They're coming back in raindrops. Um, yeah, we're not, 
we're, we're not saying, I wouldn't say, that all these jobs are going to come back to the U.S. because there aren't. What we're going through is an evolution, right? So we're uh, we're going through the the next, the future state, and that means that the jobs that are coming back are going to be more automated, are going to be more skillful. So um, yeah, I, you know, even though a lot of um, uh, assembly workers and that kind of thing have been offshore, that, that's not the kind of jobs that are coming back. So they need these people need to be retrained for higher level skills, um, or new people coming into a manufacturing environment have to be uh, higher level. And so yes, and you're absolutely right. Robotics, um, higher class machining, more automation. All of that will reduce the number of jobs that are required, the amount of labor that's required. And so we see that changing from simply warm bodies that sit on a manufacturing line to trained and skillful workers. And there are a few of them, fewer of them, um, but they're more skillful and operating at a higher level. Okay, thank you. Um, what sort of government incentives are available, uh, perhaps more at, at the federal level, not at, at local level? Okay, the federal level, so, you know, I think I talked about it as being kind of a backbone or a context. So at the federal level, there's some reform in terms of taxes, there's some uh, looks at uh, uh, making manufacturing uh, requirements and laws such as OSHA laws and so forth less onerous for a manufacturer. Um, and so the incentives are with respect to better laws, less taxes, more innovation. Um, the, in the development of innovation hubs is really a great approach. So there are um, advanced studies in robotics and those kind of things going on right now in, in these innovation hubs across America. I think there's a lot of them up in the Northeast, um, where uh, so much of the, the manufacturing environment has been devastated. So the federal government really provides context and backbone more than um, a lot of incentives. So the incentives when it comes to training incentives and tax incentives, and, you know, lower power rates, all that, that's all state and local uh, governments. So the federal does the backbone kind of the context and then and then the each individual city is providing kind of money if you will okay great thank you uh, next question you spoke a little bit about um, how manufacturing buildings uh, are not like your grandfather's uh, buildings and they're they're different because things are done differently now could you uh, go into a little more detail about your knowledge of perhaps um, where in and, and you know we know that we want to uh, I mean you you spoke extensively about the where but particularly are we talking rural or suburban locations where there's a lot of land available or are we talking about infill or repurposing uh, old manufacturing buildings that have been vacant for years and years um, so, so if you could speak a little bit to that. Yeah, the answer to that is yes. <laughs> um, you, either one, um, any place is open. So, you know, if you, if you really, sometimes we're working with clients and they say, you know, we know this area of Virginia or, you know, we want to be out on the outskirts of Atlanta or something like that. So they have a, a, a general idea of where they prefer. Um, for some reason or another, sometimes it's an executive that wants to live there, or you know, for some reason they're they're locating in in a certain place over another. So you know, we would start off asking that question: Is there a preference, first of all, and then looking at various communities? Now, some sometimes also, I mean, if your customer base is in Oakland, California, for example. Or here's another good example. Um, a couple weeks ago, I was talking to an aerospace manufacturer that makes hinges for Boeing jets. And um, so those jets are manufactured in the aerospace environment in Southern California and in uh, you know, Seattle. Um, and so it that wouldn't really make sense for them to be uh, located far, far away. I mean, they should be in alignment with 
their own supply chain, not only where they can get products, but also um, where they have customers. So location is often related to things like that. So where do you want to go? You know, where is your customer base? Where is your supply base? So these are all questions that we would ask and evaluate. Um, then in addition to that, you, you must pay attention to skills. So, you know, I gave the Otis Elevator example. When you don't pay attention to the skills, you don't have the right skill base to run your manufacturing plant, you've got a problem. Um, you, just, you just can't expect to open, you know, make the, fling the doors open and say, okay, we're going to manufacture. I mean, you really have to pay attention to, are the skills there? Are there trained workers there? You know, is it, you know, have they been unemployed for a while? Do they need to be retrained? You know, that sort of thing. So I, I'm not sure there's one better or best location over another anywhere in America. It's just simply a matter of preference and what incentives are there and how well are you um, considering your manufacturing site in relation to suppliers and customers and so forth. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, next question. Okay, um, Russia, China, Brazil, India, and other nations are currently working to create a new world currency reserve to replace the U.S. dollar. So, how might this affect U.S. manufacturing if the dollar falls? Will the U.S. face the same challenges that Britain faced uh, when the pound sterling was replaced by the U.S. dollar as the world currency reserve? Yeah, so I've, I've heard some of that rumbling also. Um, and, I, you know, my opinion is this is a brave new world. And, and I mean, it's good for us to look back at history and see what happened in, in other economic times. But on the other hand, this isn't, you know, this isn't 2000 and it's not 1960. I mean, we're in 2015 and we're looking forward. So what happens today is going to be different and related in a different way. Um, you know, while there may be other currencies coming up, uh, I, I don't, I mean, the, the U.S. dollar is kind of the world currency standard. And everybody looks to it and the strength of our dollar and the strength of our economy is so important around the world, just really, really important. And so, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert in, in currencies, um, but, I, you know, I can tell you what I've seen is when there are, um, changes in currency rates and exchange rates, we see some incentives going on. So for example, right now the, um, the euro is down against the dollar and you know, a lot of my friends are saying, oh, we ought to go on a European vacation. So those are the kind of things that happen. But in terms of making broad sweeping manufacturing changes or locating manufacturing sites based on currency fluctuations, I, I don't see very much of that at all. Now, one, one the cautionary tale, though, um, uh, Brazil, as many of you know, is a, uh, an interesting uh, anomaly uh, because the Brazilian government protects their own internal manufacturing very, very heartily. Um, they make it very difficult to import products into Brazil. They have a big market and a lot of money, so a lot of companies want to be there and sell there. And so to take advantage of um, of the Brazilian market, a lot of companies choose to establish manufacturing there. So um, high-tech companies, for example, will set up you know small contract manufacturing in Brazil to take advantage of that particular market. And the currency exchange, the government regulations and so forth in various countries are going to affect that. Um, Russia is another good example. For, for a while, it wasn't too bad to um, to try to set up operations or sell into Russia, but since the whole Crimea, Crimea Peninsula thing happened last year, it's a it's a much more difficult environment now, much more difficult, and um, a lot of companies, American companies anyway, are backing away from that because of it. So you have to pay attention to the political environment, definitely the currency exchange around the world, but that's not what's going to drive development of reshoring in the U.S. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, a couple folks are asking, um, on slide number 25, you talk about um, a SAP and SAP. What okay. is it? Oh. <laughs> That's the question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. 
SAP is an ERP system, so it's a business system. Um, and they're actually, I think they're the largest software uh, functional system, ERP system in the world. So big global software company. Um, and it you know, runs businesses. So the other competitors, you, you may have heard of Oracle. Before, that's another big ERP system. Um, software or, uh, Microsoft Dynamics is another. So <clears throat> these are software systems that run your business, your financials, and your planning, and your manufacturing. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, so um, are you aware of any um, good sites or uh, um, anything in particular where we could find out where our local, state, or even, you know, federal politicians who are, is supporting reshoring initiatives? Um, are there routes to figure this out, where to find them? Ah, oh, what a great question. <laughs> So we've been talking to legislators, um, both in California as well as I was in Washington a couple weeks ago talking to people. And to a person, every legislator or aide that we spoke with is all in favor of reshoring. We haven't heard anybody that was opposed to it because it represents economic growth and jobs in their constituency. And I would say, just about everybody has some sort of platform or another to support reshoring of some kind or another, either jobs growth or something like that. So um, I, I don't know whether there's, I can't think of one good place or anyone particularly that jumps out as being particularly outspoken about it, but everybody's talking about it. So if you're considering, for example, a location in um, you know, a, a particular city or town, um, I, I would definitely call the uh, legislator's office in that area and say, you know, how you feel about this, right? How can you support me? What can you do for me today? Um, and I think you'll find that they're very open to that kind of discussion and in many cases will have something to offer you. Okay. And then I guess sort of, sort of with that, could you talk a little bit more about um, uh, NNMI institutes or innovative hubs and uh, their roles in supporting and working with reshoring? Yeah, so the innovation hubs, that's the, the federal government's um, incentive to get things back and go back up and running. So the couple that they have going right now, and you can search on them online, you can just search on Innovation Hubs and they'll, they'll come up. But they have a, a few going already and they're, at, they're adding more and more each year. And usually they're dedicated facilities to something or another. So like um, I think there's an Innovation Hub right now that's fully dedicated to robotics. So how can robotics help in a manufacturing environment? And all of these innovation hubs are really focused on uh, um, reshoring or advancing manufacturing. Because it's a little broader than just reshoring, but advancing manufacturing in America. And the reason why is, and the reason why there's so much attention here, is that manufacturing is really the backbone of the economy. I mean, if we don't rebuild our manufacturing and end up being a total service uh, economy, um, we will not have the depth and hardiness and the growth that we expect in this country. So, you know, really focusing on innovation, how do we get better at this? How do we make improvements? How do we think about the future? What's coming next? That's, that's the kind of issues that are in these hubs. And then my understanding is that each one, I haven't not been to any of them yet, but my understanding is that each one is dedicated to something different. So one may be a plastics hub, for example, one may be a robotics hub, one may be, you know, uh, milling machines or something like that. So. Uh, but you can you can search on them online and get more information there. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, regional planning agencies they prepare SEDS, uh, comprehensive economic development strategies. So, what is if you if you were to tell us one thing that local governments should invest in the most? What would you say? Would you say, for example, education, community colleges? Uh, um, you know, uh, trade schools. What's the one thing that you would that you would tell us to invest in to uh, increase the success of reshoring? 
Yeah, I, I would say it would be education and community colleges because the skills gap is the one thing that's point, pointed to most often in companies trying to reshore or locate uh, production facilities in the U.S. is that the skills are just not there. And so um, focus on uh, education and particularly at the community college level um, uh, is the right thing to do. So there's, there's some community colleges, especially in the South, where they have just made a tremendous effort um, with their governments, local governments, to um, develop programs that are that are aimed squarely at this need. Um, so there are community colleges that set up model machine shops, for example, um, and they train machinists on how to program an NC machine or, you know, how to how to do simple programming of a robot. And so they're actually training skilled workers in their own machine shops at the community college level, and that's fantastic. And uh, you know, there's a number of companies that are um, partnered with those. Uh, those kind of companies that, or those kind of colleges that will produce the right skill sets for what, what their needs are as they're developing new manufacturing plants. So for government's perspective, I mean, you, you need to, you know, governments need to provide incentives for sure. You need to focus on what businesses need and talk to businesses and say, you know, what is it that will make this attractive? But, you know, what bubbles to the top over and over again is definitely the education connection. Okay. okay, thank you. Um, so you've spoken about um, a little bit about how uh, federal agencies are relaxing some of the rules and regulations to help promote things like uh, reshoring, but um, we have a question here that often we hear about federal tax policies and environmental regulations driving businesses offshore. Uh, do you, do you believe that? Do you think that that's accurate? Do you think that the federal government has some ways to go to uh, to better uh, attract uh, manufacturing back to the U.S.? Yeah, I, I think you know that's um, kind of an aging thing. Um, certainly in the last 10 or 15 years there's been a lot of that. So you know we saw a lot of companies from a business perspective, a lot of companies were uh, broken up into different divisions and then pieces of it were shipped overseas uh, or whole production lines. Um, you know, look, take an example, the furniture industry um, was devastated, devastated by um, and really gutted by uh, Chinese manufacturing um, because the Chinese could uh, manufacture furniture at about a third of the cost. And so here we are as American consumers, and we want the same quality, but at a third of the cost. So um, you know, we we are cons as consumers, we're driving that low cost production. So a lot of companies did that. I mean, they broke up, they split up their divisions, they sold it to private equity, they shipped stuff overseas, and all of that. But I I think that the stem of that bleeding or that bleeding has been uh, stemmed. It's been stopped and slowed down significantly, at least, um, where we're not seeing so much of that anymore. And what we're working towards, both at the Reshoring Institute as well as Blue Silk Consulting, is to work with our clients so that they, so that the senior executives ha take a broader perspective. So we say, okay, yeah, you can get cheaper labor for making T-shirts overseas, but you really also need to consider the total costs what everything is involved in and look at that in in terms of making your decision. So it isn't just about, as, as I showed you, it's not just about having lower labor costs because in China, you know, the, the, we, we just can't compete with the labor costs in China or, or uh, Indonesia or Bangladesh or Vietnam. And we probably won't be in anywhere in the near future. But when you look at the total cost, so when that cost includes uh, logistics and it includes um, quality issues and it includes travel costs and all these things, um, then the economics change. So you know we're working with senior executives to change that view, and you know I'm 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 very optimistic about that. I, most of the executives that I work with agree and they nod and they say I get it you know <laughs> uh, we should be looking at the bigger picture not just how we can how we can shave off stuff and go to a low 
cost nation. So, you know, I'm seeing a lot of that stuff happening too. And now I can't remember what the question was. <laughs> um, I, I think you answered it. I don't remember okay. what it was okay. now. I just deleted <laughs> it and I'm already on to like figuring out the next question. <laughs> Um, okay, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> um, I, I think we have time for for one more, and um, I have to try to work this out as I say it. Um, so, right now we have, in, in terms of labor force, that that's what this question is surrounded by. Um, so we have uh, a lot of uh, people right now that are heading into retirement. You know, we have our baby boomers that are going into retirement now, and the next generation that's stepping up. We have some really highly educated people, um, and you know, we actually had a webcast uh, a few weeks ago about uh, the next, this next up and coming generation. The generation that I'm part of, we're super highly educated, but there are you know uh, so many of us that don't have jobs. And, to, you know, there are theories out there that it's because they think that they need better jobs than what's available to them at the moment. Um, do you think at all that there might be some issues? Um, I, you mentioned uh, the Otis Elevator where they just couldn't find folks to, to work. Um, do you think it's on some level a choice that some of these more highly educated people think, no, I, I don't want to do manufacturing uh, and I don't want to get paid, you know, eighteen dollars an hour to start off I, I I want something better I have a master's degree do you think that that's all going to be a, a problem across the US as this next generation uh, really steps up and and fills in the workforce yeah so you know I mentioned this before we have to start talking about manufacturing in a different way so if you were in Germany for example manufacturing is a very good job in Germany and if you go to the Mercedes plant, for example, you'd be like be incredibly amazed at the amount of automation, how clean it looks, how exciting it is to produce these products. That's the way we need to think about manufacturing in the U.S. So we have this idea that you know manufacturing is um, not fun and it's not the best job, and it's you know, and we need to get over that because what's coming back. The new, exciting, you know, clean and sophisticated and automated and you know, manufacturing plants that are producing great products in the U.S. Those are great places to work. I mean, they're innovative, they're forward-thinking, and you're actually making something. And I, I think part of the problem is that we just have to get out of this mindset that manufacturing is bad and it's for you know, horrible. Uh, manufacturing sites in China. It isn't like that anymore. And certainly we don't want it to be like that in the US. So it's a mindset that we all have to think about. And I would highly encourage anyone who um, has an advanced degree to think about manufacturing. Think about working in a manufacturing site. You'll, you'll find it's very, 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 very interesting these days and quite rewarding to be able to produce products that are um, cool and innovative and, you know, I mean, shoot, who wouldn't want to work in a, uh, you know, a apple plant in Texas or, you know, a place like that where you're really creating new products and innovation and free thinking and, you know, stuff that's exciting for the future. So I would definitely do that. All right. Um, can I, just one thing I wanted to add. Yeah. One thing I wanted to add on the final page. We have a, a Facebook page that's just called Reshoring, just Reshoring. Um, and I would encourage everybody to uh, like that page on Facebook because we post articles there almost every day and on reshoring. Um, we're also developing an online library at the Reshoring Institute. One of our interns is working on that. We should have that up within the month, which will be searchable and you'll be able to find if you're looking for articles about a certain area or a company or you know something, um, there will be a variety of ways to search. Um, through those articles. But in the meantime, like us on Facebook, and again, it's just reshoring, not reshoring institute, although we have that page too, but just reshoring, that's where we're posting most of the articles, and I think that will help people stay up to date on the arguments and the new things that are coming and all the advanced research that's going on in that area. All right. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you, Rosemary Coates. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Reshoring Institute and um, your uh, consulting firm, which is Blue Silk, is that right? Did I get that right? 
Blue Silk Consulting. Blue Silk Wonderful. Consulting, yeah. Okay, and thank you to the Economic Development Division for hosting this session today. And uh, everyone, uh, have a great weekend, and we will talk again next time. Thank you.